Hey, Dan. Hey, long, long time no, uh, no see. <laughs> hey, how are you? Good, good, good. Yeah, yeah. It's been. Uh, I, I was always guaranteed to see you once a year at the Chicago. At least, I mean, we would talk a little bit, but at the Chicago seminar. But since COVID, we've had so many students say they'd love to get it going again in Chicago because they miss, you know, seeing you and all the other folk. Yeah, they miss. They miss coming to the big city. Come oh yeah, they, yeah, that's it. They met. Now, have you started? Have you guys started up live seminars? And- oh yeah, yeah. We're finishing up. We've been go- on the road the whole year. Oh, Our that's wonderful. Been, yeah, it's been crazy. I mean, I just had five hundred people in L.A. last Saturday. I'll be in. Uh, yeah, yeah. We're doing. I'm in Florida next week. Then I'm doing. Then I'm doing one in Denver the following week. So. Yeah, I didn't know if, uh, do you notice, are are a lot of people comfortable coming out to bigger? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Our stuff is absolutely packed. Can't even, we can't even fit people in in the places next year. We have to go to a bigger, you know, bigger venues. That's a good sign. You know, you told me uh, when I, when I had emailed you a few weeks back, you had said you were going to Harvard to speak. And I just, I got a little concerned. Am I going to, should we be calling you Dr. Tom yet or not? Yet? No, 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 no. I gave a, I, <laughs> I, they invited me to debate some guy about active versus passive. Oh, good. Good. So yeah, it was fun. And I bet it was. I bet, I bet it was. Yeah. He, 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 he hated it. The other guy, but um, cause, cause he wasn't used to like, you know, it wasn't, he wasn't used to this kind of stuff. Did he have any clue with options at all? Or no, 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 no. Okay. He was, he he was a babe in the woods. Like he had yeah. no idea. He was he was very out of his league. You know, like I'm like right. I, this dude. He's like he's like I'm not going up against you. He's like he's like that's I'm gonna you're gonna make me look like an idiot. And I go no I'm not. I swear I'm not gonna I'm not here to hurt. You know yeah I'm not here to do that. I go well, you just try yeah and you're just trying to get the information out. What do you sure? Want- so let's go any direction you want. What do you want to What do you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean if if you want to start with I mean j- just one thing that. I think we've all wrestled with in the last year is this fascinating, you know, I look at it as a positive, the zero day stuff that people are just, Hey, you know, they're getting engaged through that Avenue. They're coming into the options business through the zero day interest, which to me can be a bit of gambling, but to me, it's an opportunity for people to come in and, you know, you can engage them in different things. What has been your thoughts on the whole uh, zero day stuff? I traded some last night, but in general, my my participation in the zero DTS has been relatively low. Yeah. So I'm I'm not really a um, I'm probably not the best person to ask, only because so so I mean, or what do you time, think like from an industry? I mean, just even oh well, from an industry going, standpoint, I mean, obviously it's been good because people like you know people like the zero DTS, but for me personally, I've been pretty much a one trick pony in there. You know, I've been like um, um, I do one one DTE mostly do one DTE like at the money or slightly slightly bullish because I usually think the market opens up a little bit, but slightly bullish. $30 wide, like traditional butterflies. Because first of all, the, the problem in SPX is you, you can't really do anything naked because it just ties up so much capital. That's right. And the other problem with it is that that I our research is really clear that you can't hold zero DT positions much past half day. So like, so I prefer to put them on the night before and take them off the next morning. Um, but there's just too much research that suggests the risk just gets... Uh, that just gets a little bit difficult to manage, almost impossible to manage after with two hours left in the day. So I prefer put them on the night before, take them off this morning. Like yesterday, just to give you an example, I bought a $30 SPX, $30 um, wide call butterfly. I put my center strike about $10 above where they closed. You know, we opened up this morning, made a buck and a half or a little, maybe a little bit more yeah. around a buck and a half, buck 60 on the trade, took the trade off by 832. You know, I was done. Is that is that a good trade? Yeah, it's pretty good. Not bad. Yeah. You know. And and you know, as you said, you can get out of it. Unlike unlike a lot of people, it seems like you're babysitting these things all day. They take up a lot of time. And do you really feel comfortable putting a lot of size? But I've liked these these I've done so we've been doing some of these. I agree with you going down this zero day in the last year. I've more looked at one to four day stuff as a result of that. 
I mean, just well, because I mean, that, that seems to make more, you know, obviously if you give yourself one to four days, you are, you know, you're going to reduce your risk by a significant multiple. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I've been pretty committed to, to the, you know, to the 45 days in most of my positions, sure. but I have plenty of stuff that, you know, that's, that's always in play and the market's okay. moving around enough that I would, I found I'd rather put on more positions and have less risk in more positions than more risk in less positions. I got I'm not you. sure that you and I have always been on the same page on that, but, but it's, all, but, but I've been sticking to that method for now for, you know, pretty much the last decade. And it's, it's worked well for me as a screen based trader. Yeah. So I like more positions, um, less volatility in those positions, less risk in those individual positions. I and I feel like it's made managing everything a lot easier. No, and that makes sense. I mean, we will do fewer via few or I said I should say fewer trades, but we're not, you know, I'm not talking stocks. It would be an SPX. Oh, sure, or, sure, sure. SPX or spy or maybe less rut. And so that, but but I agree. Are you doing more? Would you say if you have a lot of positions? different ETFs, different indexes, different stocks or uh, until recently, you know, I've been I stick I'm very I'm a liquidity freak. I agree. So, I agree. Yeah. So I have not varied from the most liquid underlines. I mean like I I think as a trader in 2023, you know, you, you have, there's a core group of whatever you want to say, five or 10 stocks that have the the lion's share of the liquidity That's and you right. almost have to stay in those stocks. So you've got you know, you basically got the big seven, you know, and, and throw a couple extra ones in there just based on what's happening. And in the commodity world, I almost always, you know, I mean, I always have positions on in the SPY, Qs, and IWM. Yeah. And I always have positions on like kind of in crude oil, let's just say, or yeah. some, a couple other commodities. But for the most part, you know, my equity positions boil down to whatever is consistently active. So, you know, I'm on, I'm in Apple, Amazon, AMD, Google, Meta, Microsoft, Netflix, NVIDIA, you know, the who's who of, and Tesla. The who's who I was going to say, I was, I didn't hear Tesla. I was going to, cause that's pretty. No, Tesla is probably the most liquid of, of any stock. It's probably Tesla. More than Apple. I mean, personally, I think you get for bang for the buck. Right. I think you get better fills in Tesla than you get in Apple. Wow. That's impressive. Okay. So so liquidity, Tesla one, Apple two, what would be three in terms of stocks that you found? Um, well, you have to also, you know, adjust by price. So, Absolutely. Right. So 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 I I'd probably go in NVIDIA Amazon or Amazon NVIDIA. Those would be the next two. Because they're higher uh, price. Yeah. Yeah. And also because they they seem to have better markets. Like the one stock that that I don't love the fills and it's probably Microsoft. I feel like Microsoft is an extra penny and give up mm. than everything else. Okay. Um, I feel I feel like Netflix is actually really good at, you know, I mean, I feel like Netflix is good too. I feel like Microsoft is the only one of the big seven that requires an extra penny sometimes and theoretical give up. Um, other than that, like, they're the least aggressive market makers. I'll put it that way. Um, mm. But then there's probably on top of that, there's probably at least, at least, you know, 20 to 40 more underlines that are all within, you know, a half a penny as far as theoretical give up. So, so you can go down the line. There's a lot of tradable stocks. That's all a lot. What do you think? I mean, obviously spy is part of SPX. It's the same type vehicle. Yeah. Have you, do you mess with SPX at all, Tom? Um, I, I do mess with SPX. I mess with SPX. I mean, my, I trade spy 10 X 10 times more. Because I guess gotcha. most of my short premium is in SPY, but I do mess with SPX. I have SPX positions on. And in the zero DTs and the one DTs, I only trade SPX. But okay. um, because I don't like XSP and I don't like dealing with the assignment risk at the end of the day if I have something left in the spies. So I much prefer cash settled index. So I am SPX all the way. And I do usually keep a core SPX and a core ES option position on, but they're very small. I don't I don't do any size in there at all. You bring up a good point, I, and and I haven't delved into you know in the community we haven't done. I know some students do ES, which is a future option. What do you? What's your thoughts on there? What advice yeah, sure. as far as I get? I get nervous with that for newer traders, but um, well, you know, it's half the size of it's half the size of SPX and yes, it's one, 
E forward slash ES options are half the size of SPX. Okay. And they're five times the size of SPY. That just gives you some context. Okay. They're they're one tick wide for all spreads are one tick wide. So you don't have to do any price discovery because you okay. either get filled at mid price, which is rare, or one tick off mid price, no matter what you want to do. Two wow. legs, three legs, four legs, everything fills one tick off mid price. Wow. But so the thing with ES is, and and everybody should trade ES options when when you know in the mix. Yeah. The thing with ES is you get span margin, so it's six times more capital efficient. Hmm. Um, so that's the good thing. The bad thing is, you know, it's it's a little bit confusing at first when people trade it because it's fifty dollars a point. So it's just okay. it's a little, rather than a, you know rather than a, rather than hundred rather hundred dollars a point, it's fifty dollars a point. But but it's six times more capital efficient if you're doing naked options. If you're doing spreads, it's the same. It doesn't matter. So if you're doing naked options, you'd rather do it in ES than SPX or SPY. No, I do naked options in SPY because I like the single point strikes and all the liquidity and everything else. And it fits okay. my position better. But if I'm doing naked options in SPX or ES, I do ES because it requires it requires um, one sixth the amount of capital. However, if I'm doing zero DTEs, I'm almost always doing it in the SPX. They're I got all. You. Dan, they're all the exact same product. They're literally the exact same product. They yeah. tick together, they expire together, they are have all this. There, there's no difference between any three of those products. Okay. And then the other one you mentioned, which is because I've been thinking about these to expand a little bit. You mentioned like oil is one. What's the symbol that you trade on the oil? Well, if you're going to trade oil, I find that the oil ETFs, um, USO, XLE, um, uh, What's the other one? OIH and and I'm blanking on the next one, but whatever. I I don't like their their market their markets. They're fair at best. Mm. The in forward slash CL, yeah. which is a, which is a big product, but it has single point strikes. Um, every single spread is one tick off mid price, so there's zero price discovery you have to do. Wow, so great liquidity. Okay, oh, no, on hundred times better liquidity than on the equity side. Wow. Because the underlying, because the because it has it has an efficient underlying, so it trades one it trades one tick off theoretical, and um, that's it. I mean, that's, you give up one one tick to to do anything you want. How's the volatility in in like oil right now compared to like an SPX? Is it you get to see on pretty a percentage basis? I mean, because of all the crap going on in the Middle East and things like that, you know, you would think, but on a percentage basis right now, let's just take a look. Just we'll see where we are. Do you yeah. want to share your desktop at all, or I mean, like let's just play around with crude oil. I'll just give you some examples. So here's crude oil. Here it's already traded, you know, 176,000 contracts today. And if we went out to let's just say we go out to December, and yeah. you know, I mean, you can see the volume in here. It's, it's got hundreds or thousands at every level. Oh yeah. And it just depends on kind of you know what do you want to do. Um, you know, I, I'm just going to give you some examples here just to show you. So let's just say I wanted to do, for argument's sake, I wanted to do a 16 delta strangle. Okay. Right. So I go to 16 delta call. I'm And I'm going to go to a 16 delta put um, right here. And so you're going to come up with 224 is the mid price in DEES. So yeah. this is 40, 48 days out. Volatility right now is 44, wow. which is really high for crude oil. And okay. the expected move by December is nine points. One okay. of the things that I like about, you know, about the Tasty platform is that, you know, everything's right in front of you. So you sure. got a nine, 937 expected move currently trading at 83, which is why the 16 Delta, this is basically a perfect one standard deviation to the downside. And this is just, you know, just a slightly over, you know, one standard deviation because there's upside skew in, in crude oil. Yeah. But you can see mid price here is 224. So if I route this order at 224, It'll pop in here. And I was going to say, I, I won't be filled. But the beautiful thing about crude is if I go set up the same order, similar order, and at 224 is the mid price, and I move it one tick to 223, like I said, you'll be filled one tick off mid. I wasn't filled. <laughs> I just gave you a perfect. But usually, example. usually. Yeah, usually you're filled. Maybe it's just because this is December and the front month is still November. Yeah. But, um, oh, there I go. Actually, I filled them both. Wow. 223 and 224. Now, Tom, what okay. was the margin on those? Uh, let's is this see. a span, right? Span? Yeah, or? this is span. So let's just see similar order. And so there's no like portfolio margin or whatever. So each trade tied up about um, 5,000, 4,800. 
Okay, which now is it's a, it's a big product. So when you sell something for two twenty four, you're taking in two thousand two hundred and and it it's it's time wow. you know so it's it's two thousand two hundred forty dollars. That's a big premium. Well, on forty eight hundred dollars of capital. On forty eight hundred dollars in capital. That's yeah, pretty to, amazing. To give you to give you an example, if you did if you did the same thing like on USO or something, you'd be putting up five five or six x as much money. Now, if you did something else in crude oil, let's just say I'm in December and I wanted to sell. Um, are you bearish or bullish in crude oil? I have no opinion, Tom. <laughs> I don't I haven't been following it. Let's okay. say bullish. So let's, let's say let's, bullish. Let, let's do this. Let's make it. Let's make it. We'll we'll iron condor it. We'll have a little fun with this. Okay. So I'm going to use the same strikes that I used before, right? The same short strikes as 16 Delta. Yeah. But I'm going to go two and a half dollars wide and I'm going to iron condor it off. So I'm going to go 99 because you can do half, they have half point wide strikes here. Oh, so great. 99, 10, 101 and a half on the call side and, and 72 and a half, 70 on the put side to make it a pure, clean iron condor. Collect 53 cents as mid price. That's just about one quarter of the width of the strikes. Yeah. Okay. So it's a 75% probability of success. Yeah. Mid price is, is hovering back and forth between 53 and 52. Yeah. I'll go to 52 and I'll be filled. Oh man, I'm giving the worst examples today because Oh, that's okay. I mean, but it got filled a few seconds later. Oh, there you go. Here it goes. Yeah, filled. Yeah. Yep. Wow. That is usually, that is usually they're instantaneous. I don't know why somebody's thinking about this. And there's and you know, there's my fills in here in, in Dece in in uh in crude oil. So that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So that's so much easier than trading something like XLE, just yeah. as an example. I mean, you know, XLE, let's just, let's just, let me just show you something. Well, you know, yeah. it's hard for me to show on this account because this account has portfolio margin. So okay. it's not going to show you the same margin as you'd get within. Oh, I got margin. it. I got it. Yeah. So I can't, but, but futures and futures options do not qualify for portfolio margin. They're two different margining systems. But how close you, you bring up a point. So in a portfolio margin account versus a normal retail trader that does a uh, futures option, you're still getting better margin than you would on somebody doing SPX, right? In a reg T account. No, no. Portfolio margin will give you the same. Uh, basically portfolio margin is the similar to span. Okay. So if you have portfolio margin, which at Tasty you need to maintain a balance of over 150,000. Okay. Um, of which you will have the same margin requirements essentially as futures. So it's about five or six times better for naked options than it would be if you had regular traditional margin. So span um, is basically portfolio margin, but you don't have to put up 150. You don't have to put up anything. Exactly. Wow. Okay. That's what span is. Okay. And, um, but we have no control over any of those rules or any, you know, any of that stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's it's a little bit of a you know crazy world, but it's um uh you know they're two different margining systems. They're both built in the back end of Tasty, so you don't have to worry about it as a customer. Um, but you know, you know, obviously capital efficiency comes into play. So sure. if you wanted to do a spread in XLE that where you took in a hundred dollars credit, or you want to do a spread in in um, CL where you took in a hundred dollars credit, you know, it's 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 basically the same thing. And that wouldn't be any different. The only thing different is for naked options. Okay. Uh, Martin said here, he said, he says, I like the price action and CL, which you talked about. How about MCL? What well, I don't even know what that same, is. MCL is the micro version. It's the exact same thing. So if I go back to CL, I mean, everybody's going to like the price action CL because because it's been crazy active. I mean, you can see this is, this is just wow. a chart of it. But wow. if I typed in MCL, which is the micro version, okay, um, it's exact. It's exactly the same. There's no difference. It's just, Cheaper. you know, just a smaller contract. Okay, that's all it is. It's it is exactly the same, and it's only traded. You know, it's a smaller contract and it, only, and it trades less. But there there are options in MCL, but the options aren't. They're not as good. They're not as liquid. You can see yeah. nothing trades. So the bad thing, the, the good thing about MCL is it's a it's a micro contract, which is cool. The bad thing about MCL is that you really can't, you have to do CL options because nobody trades the MCL options. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Tom, let me, 
well, let me just switch as I'm looking at the market. Okay, SPX is 4147. Obviously, we've been down pretty good the last couple of weeks. And VIX is still near 20, upper end of the range over the last couple sure. months. From a classic, can you know, I think a lot of us from the CBOE would I I would think would fall into the contrarian category. What's your thoughts here? I mean, it's we haven't really started the ascent up yet. Are you starting to build some positions a little bit, um, selling some puts or something? What, what What's your thoughts here? Well, I think we're all leaning a little long for two reasons. One, because we've had a big sell-off. And as premium sellers, when you have right. a big sell-off, you end up getting long. Right, by right, 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 um, that's right, one thing. Right. Second thing is, like you, you know, I happen to be long a little bit of stocks here just because of the, by virtue of the sell-off. And also, I'm long bonds, which is... You know, they kind of been moving a little bit in tandem. Okay. Um, but I, I I think the VIX today is actually really interesting because even when we sold off, the VIX stayed down. And people were emailing me, you know, like like before I just before I started with you, we finished our show this morning. They were like, Why is the VIX down 43 cents when when S and P's are down five dollars? They've had a huge sell-off. I mean, I know the Nasdaq's super strong, but the VIX has been crazy weak all day today, which yeah. is why I don't think you're gonna see a sell-off today. Okay. Okay. But you don't necessarily believe the sell-off is, is over yet, possibly. You know, it's, no. a, it's a great question. I think we are oversold. I don't think that we've capitulated per se. Like, I don't think we've had that, that super ugly moment where there's the, been this, you know, mass capitulation where you've seen an explosion in volume and whatever else. But I do think that the market got to the point where I, I feel like we were a little oversold. And I feel like the VIX is sending a pretty strong message here, you know, that that we're not going down today. But maybe I'm going to be wrong. Who knows? I think you bring up an interesting point. Like I, I just think I have this conversations a lot with retail traders. They'll say, well, VIX is in the high end of the range. Sell it. And I said, well, I'd rather sell it when we we get a little indication that there's some two way, that it's, there's something here. Because I remember many a times in the pits, you know, you'd sell – a 20 volatility and you're wrong and it goes to 30 and then 40. And then you're, you like put up the red flag or the flag I'm done. Yeah. And yeah. so well, we don't, we don't, we rarely get those kind of moves anymore. I mean, we haven't since, you know, since right. we haven't really since the pandemic, but, um, it, and I think I was thinking market, more in stocks. That, yeah, that, no, no, I understand. And I think, the, but I think the market is, you know, like it's, it's always difficult for me to sell like VIX and sell volatility indexes but it's easy for me to sell volatility. So, sure. so I prefer to sell volatility in individual names rather than rather than the volatility index itself. Do you do more, Tom? Would you say you do more nakeds or credit spreads? No, or... no, I'm I'm 75% naked. Okay, 75%. Yeah, I'm 75% naked, like maybe 20% spreads. I don't I don't do I I do a lot of spreads, but it's only about 20% of my trading. Would you say when you say you're selling naked, would you say what percentage of the time is it's one side or what percentage of the time would it be a strangle? 80% of the time it's a strangle. So you're starting out where your delta yeah, are- could be it could be skewed a little bit. It could be skewed long, it could be skewed short. But 80% of the time I do both sides. Our research is really clear about that. Both sides is way better than one side. No matter what you think, because you don't know what's going to happen next. Sure. Both sides is better than one side. So you're 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 not far off of delta neutral relatively. Um, I'm a little off of delta neutral, but I'm not. You're right. I'm not far off. You're the not only far time I trade. The only time I, when I trade earnings, I have a tendency for earnings to just sell puts. So a lot of times for earnings, I won't sell the call side, but it's mostly for earnings trades only. Okay. Would you say most of your, what percentage would you say of your short strangles? would be around earnings times or you do it pretty consistently all the no, time. No, no, I do it pretty consistently. I would say that 80%, almost 80 per 75 to 80% of my trades are short strangles, 75%. Okay. So not any, any mixed month stuff like diagonals or calendars. No, or... no. When, when volatility drops like, like a month and a half ago, when, yeah, when, when it was... volatility was on its butt, yeah. I had like, I had like 40% of my account was in diagonals. Wow. Okay. So I switched because I just wanted a low vol play. They they worked, but they're just so slow moving. They're frustrating. They are. 
So diagonal where diagonal versus calendar because you could get a few deltas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I like to embed that short vertical inside of the calendar spread. I just like that's why sure. I like diagonals. I agree. I can with tweak you. it. I can tweak it up or down, you know, either way. I, now when you do those, are you still maybe 45 days out on the short, maybe a little bit longer on the long? Or are you coming closer on those? No, I use the same kind of I'm I really use I go out to whatever month is, you know, the the second closest month. I don't go out ever past like 60 or 65 days. I got you. So my long is usually in that 60 day, my shorts in the 35 to 40 days, somewhere around there. Okay. Yeah. I, 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 that diagonal, we've done a lot more of those the last year, year and a half. And I think it's an interesting tool. It gives you a little more flexibility than the calendar. It's a very low, low risk, low reward trade. Um, yeah. The the statistical, if you're doing it pretty far out of the money and you're and you're giving yourself a little directional bent, I mean, most of the time you're in the mid 80s percentage of success. That's right. So it's a very high percentage success trade. It just doesn't make it's a slow moving. It doesn't make a lot, but it's a very high win rate. Getting let, let's just stay with diagonals or, and we can expand it to short strangles. Sure. In the world of adjustments or risk management or max loss, how do you kind of. How do you, I mean, there's, there's many thoughts, you, you know, you can do multiple adjustments. You could just say, Hey, if we get to this point, I'm out. How do you look at that risk management slash adjustment and like short strangles and diagonals? You know what? Short strangles for me are easy because we roll up the untested side and then we buy the guts and sell the wings to recenter. Okay. So we have a very mechanical approach. Okay. Strangles. If the strangle, if the, if the, Call's going against you, we roll up the put. If the put's going against you, we roll down the call. And if both sides get too close to the at the money, we we buy the guts back and then sell out the wings. We just recenter and start all over. In a nonstop, it, it happens every day, multiple times in some pro stocks. Sure. But calendars, diagonals, like the fine risk trades, even like iron condors, become much more difficult when it comes to adjusting because right, right. strangles are easy because you basically just buy and sell verticals, right? That's all you have to do. Right. To, to adjust your strikes. Right. But calendars, there's nothing really you can do. And diagonals, it's again, it's another very hard adjustment. You kind of have to sit with those positions and let them play out because the success rate's so high. That's and, right. And the risk is defined. And I don't really think there's that much you can do. Okay. Now, do you have any, like in a given trade, and, and part of it I can understand, I'm just thinking ahead on the quest. I was going to say, do you have a max loss? Do you have a point on a trade where you say enough? Or do you, how, I, how much, how long do you keep up the fight on a trade? I mean, I mean I'm obviously pretty, because you're, you're very diversified. I'm pretty healthy. stubborn. I'm okay. pretty stubborn. So, <laughs> we all are, Tom. We all are. So yeah. I keep the fight going. <laughs> I'm I'm not, I don't have, I don't use stop orders. I keep okay. the fight going as long as the IVR stays high. As long as the implied volatility rank stays high, I keep the fight going as long as I can. The okay. only time I give up on trades is if is if I reduce my size, I absolutely despise my position, or I get really frustrated with a certain stock. And I'm like, I can't, I can't there's some stocks, I can't make money no matter what I do. Yeah. Like no matter what I do, they got my number. And those yeah. are the kind of stocks I just I just cover and move on. Um, name one of those stocks that has been a thorn to you. Uh, D Dog and ENPH. Okay, what the heck is D Dog? I don't even know. Data Dog. I, that I can't make money in there, no matter what I do. <laughs> and ENPH, which has earnings last night, I can't make money in there, no matter what I do. Um, wow. um There's th those are those are kind of tough ones for me. I'm mean, just to name two off the top of my head because I'm always adjusting those trades. Um, now, do you have the same, would you say, okay, let's say you have on 40 trades. How many trades would you say you have right now, optionable trades? On uh, Underlines or trades? Yeah. Option trades. Underlines or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. like you got an option trade in Colgate or whatever. Yeah, I have about, I have about 90, about 90 or 95 underlines on right now. That includes futures and, and options, about 90 or 95 and so, I always I always carry between 80 and 100. I'm kind of at the high end of the range right now. I don't know okay. exactly between 90 and 95, I say, but but I have multiple positions in some of those underlying. So it's probably a few hundred trades total. So two questions. One, how, do you keep, 
it, like on some of the, you know, if you're doing strangles in this stock, this stock, this stock, do you try to A, keep the capital pretty similar, number one? Yeah, yeah. And number two, I have trouble keeping up with three or four trades. How the heck do you, from a management, keep up? I mean, do you have... No, it's Maybe easy. Maybe give some thoughts on that. That's a lot of... Well, I mean, this, I is, this, is, this is all I do, Dan. This is my freaking life. I've been doing this for 40 years plus. I, I could... I could watch a thousand trades if I had to. It's not. No, I hear you. I, I, it doesn't yeah. even. It doesn't even. It doesn't have any meaning to me. They're just. They're. It's just. It takes me ten minutes to go through every single trade I have, and wow. and it's because I'm just. You know, um, I have my Greeks. The platform's amazing, and it's no, simple, right. and you just make simple adjustments, and you keep everything you know relatively tight, and I don't have any. You know, I mean, so you're scrolling through. You can see which ones maybe are in a little. Bit oh of yeah, 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 yeah. You can look at your P and L. You can look at your deltas. Okay. You know, like like I do a lot of adjustments at 21 DT, which is today. Okay. So today's a big adjustment day for me. But you know, I mean, the first what time is it? It's 11 o'clock. So in the first two and a half hours this morning, you know, I've adjusted a bunch of trades, but I've already made 80 trades. Wow. Okay. Okay. So so first thing you'll look at trades, and 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 key you'll look at maybe the three things you might look at to determine if you need to do something at all. You might look at deltas, p and delta, delta and p and L. Delta and day p and L are my two things that I look at the most. Me too. Delta, delta to find out if I'm lopsided on any one underlying yeah. and day p and L to find out if I've got a problem somewhere. Okay. And then are you pretty similar? Let's say you got 50 strangles on in different stocks. Do you try to keep it okay X amount of capital or do you do yes. different? How do you determine capital amount? So capital amount for me is pretty simple now each, but everybody has different size accounts and things like that, you know, sure. and I trade a fairly large account, but, yeah. but I try to keep my capital between on a per trade basis at around right around 1% or a little bit less. Okay. I mean, for most regular size accounts, normal accounts, it's, it's somewhere between three, five or 7% per trade. Okay, so if you take a hit, you have so many similar. It's being absorbed. Well, the key is the key is to have enough non-correlated underlyings and enough diversification of strategy. So, if you diversify your strategies, first of all, there's a couple of things. If you diversify your strategies, you reduce your risk by about thirty percent. Mm -hmm. If you keep your core your underlyings non-correlated, which I do a pretty good job of, you you reduce the volatility in your portfolio of about 30%. Okay. So I feel like I take, you know, 30 to 60% of the risk of, of just trading by staying small, non-correlated. And finally, the most important thing for me is I have, for me, I have to eliminate outlier risk because I don't really worry about, I don't really worry about intraday risk. I worry about outlier risk and outlier risk to me, you can eliminate it by managing early. So today at 21 days to expiration, I'm managing early. I'm eliminating my outlier risk. That's a great point. I mean, we we've, we've always. I mean, I try to get out in on the trades, and we do varying durations and maybe twenty to twenty five percent of the duration. But but I've never heard it's. I mean, and we've done it and it works. But you put it into words. What? No, no. We we studied the, this. We have studied this, Dan, for I mean, literally thousands of hours. Wow. And at the point in the decay curve, anytime you put on a trade, at about half. And about half of the length of the trade is the point that you want to get out to, to remove outlier risk. But in a perfect world, you put something on with, let's just say, 45 days, you take it off at 21 days. 21 DTE is the perfect tweak exit roll time. It's hmm. the point in the decay curve where you have where you've potentially made the most amount of money and you have the least amount of and you have the most amount of risk going forward. So if you take it off there, you've taken the least amount of risk and made the most amount of money. That's so from the K-curve perspective, 21 DT is the perfect time to close, roll, adjust, do whatever. Now, have you, a couple of questions, I mean, um, do you, um, have you diversified any duration at all? Are you, you have you, do, do you do some, do you do any like, okay, I have some 45 day stuff. I'm going to put on some 30 day or some 20 day, or do you stick with the same do you diversify your duration at all? I, I do, but not as much as I probably should. Okay. Okay. 
I like to diversify in different things, but I would do the predominant a little bit further out. But, um, oh, another question. We do a lot of SPX, obviously, and we'll, yeah. you know, we'll look at some other stuff. What, because you trade a lot more vehicles than we do, what would you say vehicles that would be more to get us some of, like you said, diversify or non-correlate, correlated? What have you found that maybe some vehicles that recommend maybe we could look into? Um, obviously, you know, you mentioned CL or others. Any that I mean, you found are that well, good liquidity? That that's one of the nice things about trading commodity options is because they're because you can do things like trade the softs, you can trade, you know, the the currencies, you can trade, you know, gold, you can trade crude oil, all those kind of things. So there is those are those are the perfect in a perfect world. But there's ETF versions of all that stuff too. So you can clearly do that. Um, but I think it it becomes it's a little more of it's it's a little bit of a skill, a little bit of an art, but you learn to be not. In this market, you just learn to not be overweighted in like okay. in the one sector that can take everybody down is is like is mega tech, right? That's right, the things right. that are mostly that are so incredibly correlated. So so like just because you're long Google and short Amazon or or vice versa, you know, or long Microsoft and and you know and and short Apple, you know, that's not diversification. So yeah. those are the problem children. I remember, and then I was going to ask you, uh, Coleman had just said he wanted to just see maybe if, if you could, uh, in a second, bring up a um, maybe a graph and explain, uh, you know, how your graphs look for a trade. Maybe just take a particular trade, maybe look at the graph. But the other question I had is, I remember some years back, uh, you had talked about pairs, and I was interested in that. I didn't uh, get a chance to spend much time. Do you still do pairs? Oh my God! Yeah, we have. Um, I traded <laughs> this morning. I traded Russell Nas. I trade Russell Nasdaq almost every day. You know, either I buy Russell. You know, I almost always buy Russell, sell Nasdaq, but I take the trade on and off, and it's been moving huge all over the place. And you can do it when you trade pairs. Trades you trade with futures. So, and now that they have micro futures. Anybody can trade pairs. So okay. yeah, I do trade pairs. I trade. I trade the yield curve by doing the twos versus tens, um, or you can do the tens versus thirties, which are all you know, perfect pairs trades. Um, depends on what you feel about, you know, interest rates and yield curve, right. but I, you can do gold versus silver, which I don't do very often. You can do crude oil versus natural gas, which I don't do very often. You can do corn, wheat, or soybeans all versus each other, which I do do quite often, but mainly I trade stock indexes. It's like right now I'm short NASDAQ long Russell. It's obviously a bad trade today, but it was a great trade for the last two days. Okay. So for people who want to learn more on pairs, what do you have? I mean, do you have shows dedicated to during the day on that or probably uh, maybe? Well, history? we've done a crazy amount of segment. The most important thing to know about a pairs trade is that it does two things. By design, it extends duration and it reduces risk. So okay. the whole thing with the, the whole thing with futures are futures are are, you know, they're big products. They're they're very one dimensional. They're they're not dynamic. They're not like strategic. So futures are very black and white. They're like. They're like stocks on steroids. Mm -hmm. And so it's very it's very nerve wracking for some people to hold a futures contract, even if they're bullish or bearish or something like that. Yeah. So why do you do a pairs trade? Because you find two highly cor correlated underlines and you buy one and sell the other. So what essentially what you're doing is because of the high correlation, you're reducing risk by 80 or 85% on the one underlying that you really want to own. Right. So, so the main purpose of pairs is A, it's risk reduction and B, it, it extends the duration because when you reduce risk, you extend duration. And the concept of trading a static instrument for all of us is the longer you can extend duration, the, the it gives you more time to be right. And we all feel like we're right at some point. We're just not yeah. always right when we need to be. What do you do on a pairs trade if it goes against you? You puke. I mean, like there's there's not much you can do. Like, you know, some so people you, some so people you have like a max pants. loss. I mean, some people, you know, like you set some targets for yourself. Like, you know, you might say, I'm willing to make a thousand dollars, I'm willing to lose a thousand, or I'm willing to, you know, there, there's no, it's not the kind of trade where you're risking one to make two, that kind of thing. So it's like, you know, you have to think about pairs trades is there's not a, you know, like it's it's essentially they're pure crapshoots in the sense that they're, you know, you could feel like they're oversold or overbought or whatever, but 
yeah. and the reality of it is that there's not really any edge to it. So you're okay. just betting on uh, essentially reversion to the mean on a basis or on a basis trade on on two things that have diverged coming back together again. Okay. Um, I have just a very general question. It would just be interested in your thought on it. Uh, somebody just said, on a hundred thousand dollar, let's assume this is an option account. What is a this is from a trader. So what is a reasonable average return per year? Maybe someone should, you know, obviously experience comes in and risk management, but what what would you how would you tackle that question for um, I, I love that question. Okay. And I will tell you how I tackle it. I tackle it very different than anybody else. Okay. So, and I, I have a very specific discussion about this. The world of trading is, to me, is fascinating because you control essentially the whole risk paradigm. You control the dynamics of the risk you decide to take. If interest rates, if risk-free rates are zero, one of the reasons people trade is because five, seven, ten percent, you know, are is is really interesting. One of the reasons people invest passively when interest rates are zero or close to zero is because passive returns have have traditionally been in the neighborhood of you know seven or eight percent when risk-free rates are are zero. But when risk-free rates go to five percent, seven or eight percent in passive returns doesn't make any sense. Like why would you take all the principal risk to make two percent? That's right. So the reason that we trade is because traders have a very different ratio or multiple that they're looking to make um, for, for, for taking all the time and resources and all the effort and all the strategy and everything that we do and all these, you know, all these sessions, you know, you're listening to Dan, you're listening to me, you're listening, you're reading stuff and every, what, everything that it takes is freaking hard. It you is. know, I mean, we it know is. it's hard. I mean, it's still, you know, I, I've been watching the markets and trading every single day for over 40 years. And I'm still pretty much wrong every single day in oh, which yeah. I think whatever I think the market's going to happen. Like, there's no <laughs> way anybody knows. There's no freaking way. So That's right. the reason that that I think returns are so interesting to me is because when risk-free rates are 5%, then people who trade need to set a target for themselves that is a multiple of 5%. Like 7 or 8% is not worth it when risk-free rates are 5% to take risk. Because right. if your goal is to make you know, 1% a month, it's very marginal to me, 12% return over risk-free rate of 5%. So right. I think in this marketplace, you know, 15 to 18 is kind of the lowest you can target for because that's a multiple of like, let's just say three, three X of risk-free rates, right. which makes all the effort worthwhile. But right. some people want to target seven X, which is 35 or 36%. You know, some people want to target more than that. It, it, I don't know. Like I have no idea each person and their tolerance for risk is different. But all I will say about that question is if you are going to have that discussion, you need to think about it as a multiple of risk-free rates. Yeah. You should not think about it as it relates to passive returns. That's a, that's a great explanation. I've, not, I've never thought of it as much from comparing it with that. I mean, obviously um, the yields are there because you're not putting out the capital that you would into buy IBM or a hundred. Of course, of course, of course. Whatever. What, um, Oh, I had a question. Cause I've been last time I was in the office visiting you, you were telling me about, I think we were talking for a few minutes with the gentleman you had who was opening that exchange, the futures for you guys and doing that. What's, what's that exchange you were, or the, the futures? The small exchange. Yeah. So we built the small exchange. This was back in like 2020, whenever we- Yeah, it's probably we the last time. Yeah, when I was- Yeah, 2021, whatever it was. We built the small exchange. We got licensed. We did the whole thing. We launched a bunch of products. It was very difficult to compete with the CME, but we tried. You know, we built our volume sure. up to, let's say, between, you know, on the low end, 5,000 contracts, the high end, 10,000 contracts a day. Yeah. We weren't we weren't profitable, but um, we were building the exchange and then- one of the crypto exchanges came along and they needed, you know, at this time, these guys thought they had unlimited money. So <laughs> they, they made kind of a ridiculous offer to us to buy our exchange. So we sold it to them. Yeah. That's and good. it was a great scalp. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. A year later, they realized that a, now there's no more crypto trading and B, they weren't making any money they they sold it back to us for one sixth of what they bought it for. 
That might be your so, best your best scalp. It's up there with my, some of my best. I'm not even going to put any numbers next to it, but I'm just yeah. going to say that it was one of my best scalps ever. Yeah, and, was, yeah. But I did it for the firm, not for me personally. Sure. Um, sure. We now own the small exchange again, and we are relaunching it in Q1. We rebuilt the all the logic. We are about to launch an exchange that is unlike any other exchange ever. Mm. It, the reason I say that is because what we did is we took a decentralized model um, of a liquidity pool based centralized model and embedded it in a listed exchange. Now we haven't gotten, we have, you know, we already have a regulatory approval and that kind of thing, but we haven't got everything we're trying to do yet approved by the regulators. Yeah. But assuming that we do, we are going to launch a brand new exchange in Q1 2024. It's going to support like equivalent of S&P 500, you know, bonds, wow. that kind of thing. But it has a very different mechanism where the customer can also be the market maker if they choose. Wow. Yeah. I won't get into I, I, a lot of details, but no, no, that's good. I'm excited. You can, be, about what, you can be on either side of the market. Let's put it that way. Wow. That that is, yeah, we'll definitely keep up with. So when Dino so wants to buy something, you can sell it to him. Can we put like automate anything Dino buys, I sell and Dino? Unfortunately, Dino sell no. Anything. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah. Wow. That is neat. Um, and um, wow, I didn't know that. What could you bring up for a second? What maybe explain if you don't mind, bring up anything. I don't care what 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 trade may be on the graph and show that. I I, I like some of the the, the things you got, you know, it's an interesting. Like, what do you, what do you want to know? Cause I don't, I'm not a tech, I don't use technical analysis. So I'm happy to look at anything you want. But no, you I'm in a graph, like a graph of a, in the software, just a graph of a strangle or a graph of a, how do you look, you know? Oh, oh, in the software. Yeah. Software. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure, sure. I'm not, I'm so, not technical. So let's, all, yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's pick an underlying. Let's, we, we were just talking about oil before. So let's look at XLE just for the hell of it. Okay. And I don't really trade this much, but let's just have some fun here. Yeah. And let's go to kind of a tight strangle um, just for fun. I'm going to sell a $2 call and like a, I'm about equal distance away. Let's see, 34 deltas, 37 deltas. So it's a pretty, it's a tight strangle, okay? Just for fun, okay. all right? Um, on the software, one of the things that we do is we have different modes on this platform. So this is what we call a table mode. So this is the mode that everybody kind of defaults to because it's the easiest to make adjustments. You could just drag these strikes higher. You can drag strikes lower. If you yeah, want to like make, yeah. if you want to make a little more bull, if you want to make a little more bearish, you take the put strike down. If you want to make it a little more bullish, you take the call strike up. That kind of thing, right? Okay. But um, and all your all your Greeks or all your your um, quant quantitative statistics are down here. Pop probability profit sixty one percent. Probably making fifty percent of this number, which is a dollar sixty five. 71% delta on the trade, let's do a one lot. So delta on the trade, you know, three three, but the spy weighted delta is only one. So it's equivalent of one share of stock. This is something nobody else has, which is your C bar, which is your worst, your 5% of your worst cases. How much money could That's you correct. lose on this trade? Because you're going to make 330 max, but if you make 50%, you're going to make, you know, $165. So how much risk am I truly taking in the worst of all cases? Yeah. It's about 1200. We show that we're the only platform that does that. Here's your max profit. Max loss is, is infinite. Here's the dollars required to make the trade. And that's one view that we give you. But we also give you what we call a curve mode. So the curve mode will show the strangle this way. And this is, I think, is what you're referring to. So this is the same yeah. trade. Here's the put side. Here's but I like the, the other. I, the other ones gives a lot of great information. Yeah. The other one has, well, all the information is here too. Same. Okay. You get it both. Okay. Oh, you get it. You get it on both of them. But this gives you a graphical view. So this is, you make money. Here's your distribution curve. Here's where you make money. Here's where you um, lose money outside of, you know, your, this is your break-evens. Is, you is that curve at T plus zero, Tom? Or where is that curve at? X, the white? Yeah. Or the... No, <clears throat> this is at the expiration. Oh, that's the expiration graph. Okay. Yeah. And so you can move this, you can actually move the strikes from here too. Like I'm moving the strikes right now. So you can drag the strikes. You you can trade right from here if you want to. Oh, what? you can trade from the graph. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, about 15% or 20% of our customers trade from this, what we call the curve mode. And the other ones go back to the table mode. It's completely, we're indifferent. And both so, of so, them, 
if so you some adjust people on don't this, even go to the graph. Some people would just stay in the table mode. Oh, I never go to the graph. I don't use it. Really? So you're you do most of your trading from the table. Oh, hundred. I do hundred percent. Now let me ask you: Do you have if you? I don't see you know the conventional stuff we would look at, maybe theta and vega. Oh, we have uh, all that on a different page. Okay, so, so, so yeah, the, we have we have all that. Well, we have those on a per column basis, so you can see them. Like instead of volume here, if I wanted to see, you can choose what you want to see. Oh, you could put that up. I got oh, you. you could put Vega here, you know, Delta, Theta, Gamma, Vega, anything you want. But I mean of the position. We have that too. That's oh, on a do? different okay. page. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, that's on a position page, which I just didn't pull up because I don't want to pull up all my positions on here. Oh, no, that's fine. But, oh, so on the position, when you're looking at all your trades. Oh, we have all, whatever information you want to see, it's all customizable. I got you. But, but. Most of your trading you'll do from the table, but your day to day managing will be from a screen with all your oh, trades. my day to day management from a screen, hundred percent. I got you. No, that's but like like this. What this platform is designed to do is to not it, it 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 doesn't want you to leave this this layout. So you never have to leave layout. It's a very simple, straightforward, super fast platform. So like like here's all the trades I made today. I mean, yeah. if you want to see a quick chart, you can see a quick chart up here. If you're yeah. a chart, you know, if you want to see you know, quote details, like when earnings are liquidity, all that kind of stuff, it's there. Your positions are here if you want to see them. Um, all the trades you made today are here. Or if you want to see all the XLE trades I made today, which is nothing, is here, but just all the trades I made today. You know, this is, these are all, it's probably about, I think about 70 or 80 trades already today. You did, 70, you did 70 or 80 trades today? Yeah. Oh my good. Starting at what time? Like before the you. market opened? No, I started earlier than that. Um, Six twenty-two was my first trade. Wow, that's that's amazing. Now, Tom, on this graph, I see if you go below, it gives two different deltas. One delta is a minus eleven. One delta in some symbol in front of it minus three. What's the difference in those two? Here, you mean? Yeah, there's two delta. This is the this is the position delta in XLE of a one lot. I guess this is beta weighted to the spy. Because on Tasty, we beta weight everything to the spy because, because we want to compare apples to apples. If you're going to have 90 positions on or 20 positions on, you can't – having a position on in XLE is not the same as having a position on in NVIDIA. So what we do is we, we commoditize everything and normalize everything down to a standardization. The, the key – here's the thing, Dan, with us. The whole key to everything we build is to make very complex topics – yeah. And very complex technology, simple. That's like we don't, yeah. we don't, we, we feel like this doesn't need to be overly complicated. Right. So we take the most complex stuff you can have, all these crazy Greeks, all these Monte Carlo simulations, everything that we do, <laughs> and all the models that are behind it. Yeah. We simplify everything so the customers can only focus on trading. That's wonderful. No, I, I think it's great. Um, one last question. I don't want to take too much of your time. Coleman is in Canada and he said, is tasty trade is tasty. Is it called tasty trade right now? Or what do you, the brokerage firm is tasty trade. Okay. Brokerage firm. Is tasty I, 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 I run the, the, the content side. I mean, I run the whole company, but I really run the content side on a day-to-day -day basis. Scott runs the broker side. Like we always have. Yeah, sure. And um, um, so ours is called tasty live. So the content's all Tasty Live, and the brokerage is Tasty Trade. And he wants Coleman wants to know what is Tasty Trade available in Canada? It is not, not yet, but it will be. And I know we've been saying that for the last three and a half years, but we had an issue with our clearing firm, and they got rejected by the regulators, hmm. and we had to go out and get an all new clearing firm. We are we are now basically we are on the final. We're inside the ten yard line, um, but we're not saying anything anymore because we've already we've already we already sound like idiots about Canada because they've been torturing us for what well, they've been torturing our clearing firm for three and a half years, but we but are it's, about, it's, it's, it's imminent. You've overcome some key hurdles on that. We we had to find a different clearing firm that was licensed. Okay. And we're good now. And I know you're, I found this, I know you're, you're, you're pretty close with the API also for people. It's, it's launched. It's been launched. It has been. Okay. About two months ago, we launched it. Well, great. Well, Tom, this has been wonderful catching up with you, and I appreciate you taking time. Thanks, we'll Dan. catch up. I definitely want to hear more when you launch the uh, the new thing in the first quarter. But uh, th thanks for sharing with us for a bit here, and always good to see you. Love it. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, everybody.
Thanks, um, you can reach out to me anytime. Just Tom at tastylive.com. Thanks, Dan. Right. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. Bye.